because it is good. Blessed are you, Adonai, who gave us the Torah of truth. Amen. You can be seated. We are plowing our way through some of the scriptures throughout the New Testament. We were talking about the adoption of sons. Um, last week we went into the adoption of sons, and I think we left off. Um, what's the what's the slide? Oh, okay, that's the slides. So we talked about. Oh, I have it backwards. That's why I can't remember. That's what it was. <coughs> we were talking about propagate and what it means to propagate. We we understanding that we are moving from a child to a son, correct? That where we were? Glory to Adonai. Okay, let me get rid of this so I don't get confused because, you know, I get confused slightly. Amen. So we looked at 1 Corinthians chapter 13. <coughs> Can we go to Ephesians chapter 4, which I think is before that slide. Ephesians chapter 4. So we can look at Ephesians chapter 4 really quick, verses 11 through 24. And we looked at the fullness of time has come. And the fullness of time would be, of course, when we come to the place where we have switched from a child to a son. When we are able now to walk out those commandments without a custodian, a guardian, a schoolmaster. Not that you do away with those, but you don't have to be told when to do it. You just now do it. In Ephesians chapter 4, 11 through 24, I think we might have read it before we left, but I want to read it again and jump into it. Furthermore, he gave some people as emissaries, some as prophets, some as proclaimers of the good news, and some as shepherds and teachers. What did he give you? He gave you the word. He gave you custodians. He gave you guardians. He gave you schoolmasters. This is what this is it, it, all about, right? Those who are over you. <coughs> it disappeared. Go back. Their task is to equip God's people for the work of the service that builds the body of the Messiah, until we all arrive at the unity implied by trusting and knowing the Son of God at full manhood, at the standard of maturity set by the Messiah's perfection. What are the emissaries, the pastors, the shepherds, myself, the prophets, the proclaimers of good news, the teachers? What are they there for? To equip you, to bring you into the place of what? Manhood. That you would finally get to the place where the standard of maturity is the standard of maturity of the Messiah's perfection. Are we there yet? No. So we're still striving for it, correct? So even though we know how to do some things on our own, do we still need a prophet? Do we still need a teacher? Do we still need a shepherd? Do we still need emissaries? Do we still need those that God has placed in the fivefold ministry? Yes, because what are we supposed to be doing? How am I supposed to help you? I'm supposed to help you to bring you to the place of the standard of Messiah's perfection. That's a very high standard. Right? So... When will the assembly, when will the, uh, the ecclesia be done away with? <laughs> Probably when he comes back. Because <laughs> we're all trying to strive for the Messiah's perfection. So y Yeshua, <coughs> in this ex uh, Ephesians chapter 4, is our walking example. And when we follow in his footsteps, then we too are now called the sons of the commandments. We no longer are under the tutelage of our schoolmaster, and we can now produce our own fruit. And we talked about it last week. An orange has within it what? You do know an uh, orange is something I picked out. That can be anything. You know what I'm saying? So don't go home and think I called you all fruit. But an orange within it, you see it, it's an orange, and within it has been placed the what? The seed. And within the seed has been placed a what? Another orange. So you can't do away with the word of God because then somewhere you interrupt Genesis chapter 1 verse 11 that says seed bearing producing after its own kind. And our problem is is that we have been producing after our own kind but we have been producing fruit that is not the word of the Lord. And so we have oranges that have been mixed with pears and so we have these <coughs> pear oranges and, and we have all these sorts of mess that we as man like to do. You know we like to you know, create a, have a watermelon and a cantaloupe and put it together and we call it something else. And, and we just like to reproduce, not after its own kind, we like to mix things up. And it's really kind of a, just an example of our lives of how we mix the word of God up. But the word of God is supposed to be pure, right? And because of that, we are now able to cry out, Abba, Father. 
Galatians 4, verses 5 and 6 says, So that he might redeem those in subjection to this legalism and thus enable us to be made God's sons, making us, enable us to be made what? Enable us to be made what? Who makes you a son? <clears throat> Who makes you a son? Who makes you a son? You do. Who makes you a child of his? He does. Who makes you the son? Enables us to be made God's sons. You don't become God's sons because he wants you to, even though he wants you to. You become God's sons because you enable him to allow you to be that. You are surrendering yourself. You are submitting yourself to him, and you're willing to pick up the standard of the Messiah and walk it out. So you can be a child all the days of your life. Aren't there some people who've been a child all the days of their life? Still dependent on someone to give them directions. Still dependent on someone to tell them what to do, when to get up, when not to get up. And we, we, we strive. And, and one, of the, one of the things about church people, not none of you because you're all really close to that standard of perfection of the Messiah. What, what happens with church people, they always want someone to help them, always want someone to direct them, always want someone to guide them. And though we are here to direct and to guide and to give you help, there comes a time when you need to be able to be guided and directed on your own. Because you won't always, in the middle of a storm, have someone there to guide you. You won't always, in the middle of a crisis or a situation or a pit experience, to have someone there. It would be nice if that when you walk through the valley of shadow of death, somebody was there with you. And most of the time, we want to bring someone with us, don't we? I'm going through this, you're going to go through this with me. But remember the Torah portion. He brings a caravan with him, with his son and Abraham, and they get to the bottom of the mountain, and then what happens? They have to leave everyone and climb the mountain themselves with the load on his own back. So the context here, <coughs> again, is the comparison of a child uh, with a son. So there's a difference between a child and there's a difference between a son. A child is under the responsibility of a parent. When we look at Hebrew, it's under the uh, responsibility of a schoolmaster when we look at it in the Greek. And so they're underneath this responsibility until the time has come for them to fly out of the nest, kind of so to speak. Correct. So they're, they're, the, the job is to fly out of the nest. Now, when I talk about fly out of the nest, it doesn't mean that you leave and find an island and do your own. Flying out of the nest means that you're able to become and live a life that you're supposed to live <coughs> without even the schoolmaster, the, uh, the guardian, or the custodian always having to tell you. So you can still live within a home and still be quite independent. No one has to talk to you. You can live on your own and still need someone to help you. So it's not about the absence or the presence of where you are located. It's really about your heart and your spirit and, and what you want to do. So now they are placed as a son. They have uh, allowed God to use the fivefold ministry to bring them to the standard of the Messiah's perfection. And now they are placed as a son and have all the responsibilities and the inheritance of a son. You know why a lot of times we don't want to become a son? Because we don't want to have to do the responsibility. We want it to be someone else's. You know, the fruit of the Spirit is what? We, we talked about love and joy. And, you know, so whose responsibility is it for you to have joy? Yours. Not mine. What do we want? We want someone else in our lives to be able to say, you have caused me not to have joy. You have caused me not to have love. You have caused me not to have patience. Well, guess what? That means apparently you're still a child because there should be nothing that you can do that could cause me not to have those things because I am a son of the commandments. And therefore, because of him and his word and the spirit of God living within me, I create my own love. I create my own joy. I create my own peace from the fruit. Amen. So it's not dependent upon you. Now, you can help me. <coughs> Hello? Or you can make it really hard for me. But here's the thing. Sometimes you make it really hard. It just means I have to dig deeper. It just means I have to really depend upon the word of God. How many ever woken up in the morning and you're just not in a joyful mood? And, and you have one or two ways to go. You can remain in that state of not being joyful, which then means you're going to go downhill. Because if, you, if you're not fighting to have joy, it, it will take you downhill. Uh, as depressed as you woke up, you will be really depressed at the end of the day. Because the world doesn't help you. I mean, the world doesn't say, oh, the, you know, Pastor Jeff is depressed, so I'm just going to do everything I can to make him have joy. No, it's really the opposite. 
when I wake up and realize I am not in really in a good mood, then what do I have to do? I'm going to have to seek the word of God. I'm going to have to think on these things. I'm going to have to look at the things of God. I'm going to have to praise him for what he's done for me. I'm going to have to rearrange my thinking process because guess what? My job hasn't put me in a bad mood. <coughs> you hadn't put me in a bad mood. My wife did not do it. My dog did not do it. My children did not do it. My job did not do it. Walmart did not do it. Here's the thing. They tried to help me not be in it. But the fruit of the spirit in my life says I can have it in spite of anything. Right? Now, that's a, you know, again, that's a right and an amen, but that's really not easy to do. Hello? That takes a lot of work. I mean, after you after you fought for the first hour, you want to go back to bed because you have just fought to have joy in your life. You have fought to have this peace in your life. Now, remember, Abraham is our model, correct? And so when we look at the English word, the English word adoption is actually the Greek word, and there's the Greek word, heliothesia. And if you, none of you speak Greek, then it sounds... Greek to me too. Or literally, it's to place as a son. In context here, it is the culminating process of a child becoming a son. Those of you who have adopted a child, right? There was a process for the Warthens and um, the um, <coughs> Crutchfields and anyone else who's ever had an adopted son. There's a process in order for that child to become a son. It takes time. Uh, the, the Warthens, Crutchfields, you had to go there and live how long? Forever. She just happened to, was back on vacation. She has to go still back there. No, it was like three months. So you were six weeks? What were you? You're not helping my sermon. I'm trying to give him an idea. It was a, a long time, since none of you will agree. It is, it is over a month. They had to spend some money. They had to go to some different places. They wanted the child. They wanted the, <coughs> the, the, the male child. They wanted the female child. But that child doesn't become a son until everything has been signed, sealed, delivered, and paid for. Right? So in context here, there is a process um, of a child becoming a son. And I like that because... You know, when you give birth to uh, a child, and whether it's a male or female, let's just say a son, and they say, you know, <coughs> congratulations, you have a son. What you should say is, no, I have a baby. I'm hoping he becomes a son. No, really. I have a baby. I hope she becomes the daughter of the commandments. I hope that she comes to the place of understanding where she goes from a baby to a child and from a child to adolescence, from adolescence to finally becoming a son of the commandments, because that is my job. My job has been that I have received this very gift, the heritage of Adonai. And now my job is to train up or hanak this child <coughs> in the way he should go. And that when he is old or when he becomes the age of accountability, when he comes to the place of bar bat mitzvah, he will what? Not depart from it. That's our goal. Right. Galatians chapter four, verse one talks about what I am saying is that as long as the heir is a minor, he is no different from a slave, even though he's the legal owner of the estate. So Galatians 4, 1, the heir um, is a <coughs> slave, but when the fullness of time has come, he becomes, uh, he's a child, but when the fullness of time comes, he becomes a son. And you become a son because you start following the Messiah. You become a son because you are placed in the Messiah, and now we too, because of the Messiah, have the opportunity to become sons. Sons of Elohim. And since Yeshua is the only begotten son of Elohim, correct? Yeshua is the only, from <clears throat> for God so loved the world that he gave us what? Only begotten son. That means only one son. That means the orange has passed down and produced an orange and with the seed in it to produce what? More oranges. So if Yeshua is the only son then the only thing he can produce is just like he is, an orange within him, the seed. You, you can't be someone who's not like him if you're truly his son. You have to be like him. And even if you're outside and get adopted in, once you get adopted in, you become like them. Every once in a while when I am around the Warthens and Isaiah speaks or thinks is mine or says some things, I just look at him and I go, 
Because it's just like Pastor Kenny has <coughs> given birth to, to, to this child. It's just like they think a lot and, and talk. And I, I just look at them and I just go, wow, wow. Because when they come in and then they start being trained, right, you start reflecting. So Yeshua is the only begotten son of Elohim. Then we must be in him and in order to be the sons of Elohim, we have to be in him. So if you're not in him, you then are can be a child. But you're not and have not yet arrived to the place of a son. Now, let me add that the custom of inheritance is that my father passes on his inheritance to me. Right. And if I am a child that's still at home, still under the schoolmaster, I am an heir. But through my youth and lack of maturity, I cannot receive my inheritance. In other words, I am no different than a servant. But when I continue in my father's instructions and then I am placed as a son, uh, a bar mitzvah, I am now not only an heir, but can potentially receive <coughs> my inheritance. We do see that Yeshua began when he began his ministry he began to uh, produce healing, deliverances, and, and stuff like that. Why? Because when you become a son, then the inheritance becomes yours. This is subject, <coughs> this is the subject of Luke chapter 15, verse 11 and 12. Remember the subject of the prodigal son. And Yeshua said, a man had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of that estate that will be mine. So the father did exactly that. He divided the property between them. Because he had arrived at the age of his life that he could, if he wanted to, he can have the inheritance, right? The younger son was of age to go out on his own and was able to request his inheritance. However, when we read the story, did he follow the instructions of his parents or the schoolmaster? No. And then he soon found that his way was not producing what? Much fruit. So though he was of age. See, though you've been in a church for a very long time, doesn't mean that you've transferred from a child to a son that you can really handle the inheritance that God has given to you. Because if you're not prepared yourself to be the son or the daughter, you'll go out and squander it. You'll go out and mess it up, and you won't see anything producing in your life. As a matter of fact, he found himself more of a servant now than he did when he was just a child, because now he was kind of giving his life over to the world, and the world was dragging him. He found himself in a... And a pig pen, right? And eating corn with the pigs, which, if you're Jewish, is a really bad place to be, <laughs> right? I mean, being Jewish, you couldn't eat even a pig. You had to eat the corn. So what does he do? You all know the story of the prodigal son. What does he do? He goes back home, right? And the father treats him <coughs> once again like a... Son, he's waiting at the edge of the property and receives him back because that's how God is with us, isn't it? How many has ever messed up and then God's still waiting at the edge of the property waiting for you to come back? Amen. And he's not there with his uh, hand wagon. He's not there with disgust on his face. He's not there shaking his head. He is there with his hands lifted and welcoming you back. Why? Because he already knew what you were going to do. <coughs> he already knew who you were. It wasn't uh, flooring the father that when he gave the inheritance that his son was squander it. He knew he was going to squander it, but he still ha was at a right to have it. So in short, a son is one who reflects the image of his father. And because he did not do it, he had to come back. And a son is one who takes the trade of his father and passes it down to his son so that we can <coughs> be about the father's business. So we find in the pro as the prodigal son, when he realizes that he's messed up, he comes back and he puts himself under the servanthood again of his father. Basically, what he is saying is, I need to learn from you. I, I <coughs> you taught me, but I didn't get it. I didn't put it into practice. So we ask the self, our, uh, we can ask ourselves this question because we're going to to the next part that I uh, want to talk about. What did Yeshua do when he came? You know, the argument is, is that he came and he followed Torah. Most modern Christianity thinking is that he did follow Torah. But the thing about it is that when he died and then was buried and then he rose again, that he did away with it. And so most people will think that what he basically did was uh, <coughs> take away what was bad about pork so that we could eat it. 
um, and cause shrimp to be really good and tasty and crabs to be really wonderful. Like that's would be on his top agenda. Do you know what I'm saying? That he would climb a cross so that you may eat pig. I mean, even to the to you thinking that I, I would hope that the level of, of his sacrifice and what he did for you was not about food. It was about your soul. Correct. And we still fight about the food, but it's about your soul. We will fight to eat the pork, but won't fight to make sure our soul is intact. Doesn't make sense, does it? But that's just how crazy sometimes we can get. So what did Yeshua do? He actually <coughs> overrode the complexity of man's oral laws. This is what he did when he came. He overrode the complexity of man's oral laws and authority and showed the common people the way to a simple obedience to the written commandments of Torah and belief in the prophet Moses. What was Yeshua's job? To show you how simple it is to follow the Torah. That was it. Other than sacrificing his life and shedding the blood of, uh, on, on, uh, of his life so that you could be born again, his life, I mean, he could have done that. He could have came down at 33, climbed across. But there was more to his life than just the death and burial and resurrection, correct? There was a whole life where he was growing in wisdom and growing in stature and showing us how to live this life. Because what good is it to, to cause you to be born again and not show you the life of what it is to be born again? So he had to show you that. Plus, he had to prove himself to be perfect. I mean, you come from heaven and go right to a cross. It's not much challenge to be perfect. <coughs> it's the living everyday life of dealing with people. He gathered himself. He probably would have been easier if he just walked around by himself and, and talked to himself, but he gathered himself 12 people, which then causes another dynamic in your life, right? Because you're not only dealing with you and God, but you're dealing with you, God, and your problems and their problems and the problems they have caused you, correct? So he's just come to show us how to live. It's very simple. He's come to show us how simple obedience is. Let's look at Matthew chapter 5, 17 through 19, because this is <coughs> the crescendo. Um, and it might take two weeks, but this is the crescendo of this, of this study. And then we're going to move to something else. It says in Matthew 5, 17 through 19, because I really could be five years on this, and I really don't want to spend five years on this. Do not think that I have come to abolish the Torah or the prophets. I have come not to abolish... But to what? Complete. Yes, indeed, I tell you that until heaven and earth pass away, not so much as a yod or a stroke will pass from the Torah. Not until everything that must happen has happened. So whoever disobeys the least of these mitzvahs and teaches others to do so will be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever obeys them and so teaches will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. It has nothing to do with the kingdom of the world because there's sometimes it's the opposite. <coughs> there's people who are considered great in the world. And the reason why they're considered great is because they draw to themselves people who want to hear uh, things that they want to hear. Do you know what I'm saying? So you can be a crowd pleaser and draw a lot of people. You can be someone who speaks the word of God and have very few. So it's not really about um, what it looks like on the outside. It's really what's happening on the inside. So let's just look. In the Greek... It says, do not think I came to abolish the law of the prophets. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill. In the Aramaic, it says, do not think I came to loosen the law or the prophets. I did not come to loosen, but to fill it up or to interpret completely or correctly. <coughs> I want you, if you don't mind writing your Bible, where in your Bible where it says, I have not come to abolish the law um, I want you to over above that abolish put loosen because that's very important for us to understand because there will be some uh, very powerful truth because remember what did Yeshua say to Peter you will bind and you will loose and um, in Catholicism uh, and not to dog Catholicism but in Catholicism what that really means is, is that the Pope has the power to change and shift the ordinances and the structure of the scriptures because God had given Peter that responsibility that you can change it according to times and society and what they think. That is not the interpretation of the Aramaic or the Greek or the Hebrew. Let's look at Romans chapter 331. In Romans chapter 331, does it follow that we abolish Torah by this trusting? What's the two words? 
Heaven forbid. On the contrary, we what? Confirm toward. This is Paul. What is Paul saying? <clears throat> because I moved from here, and most of you who've been with me in the study know what here is. It's me trying to live the Torah without Yeshua and trying to make my way to heaven. But if I fail one part of the Torah, I failed of all. So therefore, the wages of my sin will be death because I cannot work my way to heaven. Someone say amen for that. But I have come over here and I have trusted Adonai and I have accepted him as my savior. Therefore, I trust him. So I live under <coughs> grace. I come in through grace. But coming in through grace doesn't mean I got and did away with the Torah or the obedience of the Torah. It just means I live out Torah now under him, not trying to fulfill my own way, but under him who has made a way where I could not have made. And then if I fail Torah, he is faithful and just to forgive me. So Paul was saying, does it follow that we abolish Torah by this trusting? So if I come and accept Yeshua as my life, does it mean then that I abolish Torah? And what does he say? Heaven forbid, on the what? What does contrary mean? The opposite is true. We don't abolish it because we came in through Yeshua. We what? Confirm it. Which means we now, <clears throat> through our lifestyle, confirm that we have come in through Yeshua because of our obedience to the Torah and the way that we follow the Torah. We do not nullify nor cancel the law through faith, uh, in the King James it says, but it may never be. On the contrary, we establish, make certain the law. We now make certain that we follow the law because of Yeshua. The Aramaic word for fulfill is uh, <clears throat> Amela, the root word Mela, to complete. This completion is not one that results in destruction, but better understanding of the promises made. So he's not come to bring it to a place of destruction, but he's come to make a better understanding of what it means. Because before we, and we still do to a certain degree, look through a glass dimly, partially. We still, we still even, <clears throat> even in our life with Yeshua, this is still foggy sometimes, isn't it? It takes the enlightenment of the Holy Spirit. It takes the power of the Holy Spirit. There are things that we are learning now that actually were still in the Bible. You, you do know that some of the newer things that you're learning didn't just come in the last five years in the Bible. You do know it's been there since the very beginning of the creation of this Bible in this written form and was there at the times of Moses. It's just coming to light to us. In a different way. So it's always been there. Correct? It's, it's the completion. So <clears throat> it doesn't come to bring destruction. It comes to bring understanding. And aren't you glad you're becoming more of the understanding of what it means? And we've got a long way to go. Correct? Well, look at Luke 1, 14. Let's also look at John 1, 14. So that you might know. How well founded are the things about which you have taught? John 1, 14. The word became a human being and lived with us, and we saw his Shekinah, the Shekinah of the Father's only Son, full of, full of, full of grace and truth. So we look at that word no, and we look at that word full, and we find that complete or full, again, is the Aramaic. Fulfill also means to have a proper understanding of a scriptural passage, such as recognizing a precise fulfillment of prophecy. When Yeshua says, this word is fulfilled in your hearing, and he said that in Luke chapter 4, verse 21. <clears throat> this word is fulfilled in your hearing. What he was saying was this, that he is the goal or object of that prophecy and has now arrived in, on the scene to do his mission as specified according to the prophecy. So when the prophecy says a child is born, a son is given, Yeshua can say, <clears throat> I am the child and I am the son. I am here. I have fulfilled that prophecy. What you thought it was, I am here. Here I am. So if you came tonight and someone said, Pastor Jeff is coming. And I'm not yet arrived. When I get here, I can say, I am Pastor Jeff. That means I have fulfilled what someone has said I was coming. Hello. Here I am. If the fulfillment has not yet happened, <clears throat> as in the case when Yeshua says in Luke 24, 
verse 44, all that is written in the Torah and the prophets must be fulfilled, then it means quite obviously that it has to be kept or adhered to, which is the act's exact opposite of passing away. So in Matthew 5, when he says, not until heaven and earth has passed away, that means we still have to adhere to it now. We still have to keep it because it has heaven and earth has not yet what? Passed away. So he has come to complete it or show us how to live it because the obvious is that it's not done away with yet. The obvious is you still got earth underneath your feet. Correct? You might live in the clouds, but the earth is still here. That is why he says he who keeps or fulfills my words shall not taste death. <clears throat> he who fulfills my words shall not taste death. Look at John chapter 12, 25. He who loves his life, what? Loses it. But he who hates his life in this world will keep it safe right on into eternal life. So if you, if you <coughs> love your life, you will end up losing your life and yielding yourself to this word. And when you yield yourself to this word, what does it do? It brings you life. And that even when you die, it takes you to where you want to go. Don't miss the sign. Don't die and realize you're going the wrong direction. John 8, 51 says, Yes, indeed, I tell you that whoever obeys my teaching will never see death. I think that's a very important verse because it, it, it kind of, and again, I'm not <coughs> belittling or taking away from your salvation, but there is a definite never see death falls on, obeys my teaching. There's an assumption already that they accept him. There's another part of your life that means you need to obey. Right? I mean, I didn't say that. He said it. I don't know how, I don't know how you can tear it apart and change it. I tell you that whoever obeys my teaching will never see death. So while keeping or vindicating Torah it's the true meaning of the word fulfill. I need to keep it. I need to vindicate it. I need to confirm it. So let's look at the word then <coughs> destroy. I have not come to abolish. I have not come to destroy. Well, destroying the Torah is an equivalent to the English phrase to break the law. So if he says, I have not come to abolish it or I have not come to destroy it, actually he can say, I have not come to break the law. I have not come to what? Loosen it. I have not come to what? <coughs> Release it or unravel it. In modern Christianity, what do we think that he did? He came to loosen it. He came to unravel it. He came to unhitch us to it. But Yeshua said, I have not come to unhitch you from it. I have not come to unravel it. I have not come to loosen you from it. Right? Because we think somehow to <coughs> be loosened from something causes freedom. But when you loosen yourself from the Torah, it causes the wages of sin is Death. So to unloose yourself from the Torah will bring death to you. To bind yourself to the Torah will bring life to you. Which one do you want, life or death? I want life. Blessing and cursing are in the Word of God, in the Torah. And we have examples, uh, Matthew 27, 17, John 19, 10, Acts 26, 32, just to read one. So when a crowd had gathered, Pilate said to him, whom do you want <coughs> me to set free for you, Bar Abba or Yeshua, called the Messiah. So we have this loosen, who you want me to loosen. We have that same word, okay? Now, besides use in the normal day-by-day -day life, loosen also had legal ramifications in the context of properly interpreting the Torah. So let's look at Matthew 16, 19. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. What do you think the keys are? His word. These are the keys of the kingdom. He said, if you, if you follow Torah and teach it, you will be great in the kingdom. That's a good key to have, right? And if you do not follow and teach others not to follow, it is... The least in the kingdom. And we already said, uh, <coughs> when we come into Yeshua, does it, does it do away with it or does it confirm it? It confirms it. And when we are obedient, there's blessing that comes our way. That's a very powerful key. Right? So, 
I will give you the keys of the kingdom, and whatever you prohibit on earth will be prohibited in heaven, and whatever you permit on earth will be permitted in heaven. I give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, right? Whatever you per, per, prohibit on earth will be <clears throat> prohibited in heaven. Whatever you permit on earth will be permitted in heaven. Lucent also had legal ramifications in the context of properly interpreting the Torah. So Yeshua was actually saying to us, to Peter, okay, <clears throat> the basis of Yeshua's teaching about binding and loosening is I give you the responsibility <clears throat> to, to be able to handle and pass down the proper interpretation of the written commandments. As a man of God, he has given me the power to loosen or bind, not change. <clears throat> but by the Spirit of God, give you some sort of an understanding of the interpretation, which is what I'm doing to you tonight, which is what I do on Torah portion, which is what other people do when they try to articulate the word and share the word of God. And all of you who've been behind the pulpit, you get behind the pulpit and you, and you <clears throat> preach the word of God. You're trying to give an interpretation of the scripture that you have read. You're not hopefully trying to change it. But you're trying to give a proper understanding of it. It's hard sometimes, isn't it? But we want to make sure the word is sure. We want to make sure the word is straight. We want to make sure that, uh, like the Bereans, that we study it so that there is <clears throat> the truth behind it, not falsehood behind it. So what was the job of Peter? Peter's job was not the job to decide what was his going to stay in and what was going to go out. His job was, what can I give to you handling the proper interpretation of loosening and binding <clears throat> that interpretation and showing you. So when someone comes and says, what does it mean to have forgiveness? His job was to interpret that and either loosen them or bind them to that part of the commandment, which they either were doing or were not doing. He had the ability to get that interpretation. We see that in Moses. Who did they go to to understand the word? Moses. And when Moses became exhausted, then Moses made a lot of people elders. Correct? Who did he give to us as a church? Emissaries, pastors, teachers, prophets. To do what? <clears throat> to equip you, to bring you to a place of maturity, to bring you to a place of manhood, to the standard of the Messiah's perfection. What does that mean? That means that whatever you're going through and whatever you're dealing with, if you come to us for advice, we have the power to loosen and bind. What does that mean? We have the power to try to give you the proper understanding and interpretation of that scripture so that you will be on the path that God wants you to be. But I do not have the right to change it because I didn't write it. If I wrote it, I could change it. Correct? But I didn't write it. Did you? You will have the right to change it if you wrote it. But you didn't. And in fact, what kind <coughs> of Yahweh is saying is, Peter, you have the ability to interpret. And really what he's basically saying, so that you don't make offense around the Torah. Now, we know that the Talmud, the Mishnah, is really offense around the Torah. And though it can be used for good, <coughs> we also know it's used for bad. And so what was what Yeshua really came to do was tear down the fence because the fence became too hard for people to do. Right? Which is why Peter gives the power, the keys, the understanding of the kingdom by the power of the Ruach HaKadosh living within him now to be able to interpret how to function without the fence. Because the fence becomes too hard. Right? And we already know what Yahweh said. That you are not to add to the word of God, which I'm commanding you, nor take away from it. So we know that binding and loosening is not someone who's able to take away and add to it. Because we have to interpret that verse in Matthew through the Torah, and the Torah says no one can add nor take away from it. So apparently then we have to look at it in the Hebrew, we must look at it in the Greek, and we must look at it in <coughs> the Aramaic and not in the English, because in the English, to us, we can loosen ourselves from it, which untie ourselves, or we can bind ourselves to it. And that's Peter's job, and Peter can do whatever he wants with it, but Peter was not there to reconstruct and change the Scripture, which is why what is clean is always going to be clean, and what is unclean will always be unclean, and what is right will always be right, and what is wrong will always be wrong, and what he said will always be said, and where the Sabbath is will always be Sabbath. No one can change it. The festivals will never change. They will always be the same, because he's the same yesterday, today, and forever, and what he wrote, he already wrote, and he's not 
changing it because he's not a fickle God. Like us. We like a fickle God because we can change with the wind. Today you feel like forgiving someone. Tomorrow you don't necessarily do. Because it really depends on who you're looking at. Right? Oh, I like you, so I'm going to forgive you. I am going to overlook some of the things in your life. You is another situation. They did the same thing. Yeah, but I like this one. Don't like this one. Right? <coughs> so, the misunderstanding that those who maybe are in charge of a church have the right to interpret. And we d we've done that, haven't we? I mean, that's why you either choose to go to a Baptist because this is what they believe. You choose to go to Pentecostal because this is what they believe. Choose to go to <coughs> Catholic Church because that's what they believe. You go to the Methodist because that's what they believe. And everyone has chosen to believe in a certain way and change and alter the scripture in a certain way. And I, and I get it that sometimes it's misunderstood. And sometimes that's one of the reasons why we don't understand. But there are certainly <coughs> downright blatant moments of departure and division where those denominations have really just decided to change what they have read to suit their own belief system. We will naturally have some disagreements. We will naturally have some moments when we don't really understand, nor maybe we interpret slightly differently. Right. Right. Well, and again, who did he give it to? <coughs> the keys of the kingdom gives it to the apostles. So if we're going to learn anything and, and follow anyone, who should we follow then? Set aside Yeshua, who should you follow? If you can't follow Yeshua, who should you follow? Who were the keys given to in the beginning? The apostles. So it would make sense to go back and study the apostles, right? So that you can get a hold of what, what the apostles believed and how they followed through. Look at John chapter 7, 14 through 19. Not until the festival was half over did Yeshua go to the temple, up to the temple courts, and began to teach. The Judeans were surprised. How, how does this man know so much without having studied? They asked. So Yeshua gave them an answer. <clears throat> My teaching is not my own it comes from the one who sent me now if he gives them the understanding of that why can't we understand that who did Yeshua learn from his father isn't that really simple if anyone wants to do his will he will know whether my teaching is from God or I speak on my own how would you know that because you would study and know that what he's saying is true you don't know anything else other than what he's saying to be true. <clears throat> if you want to do his will, which means is the word of God, you would have studied the word of God, and you will know that what he's saying is true. That's the only way you know it. It's not because he's cute. It's not because he has long hair. It's not because he has short hair. It's not because of the robes he wears. It's not because of how long his ZZs are. It's because of how he's living. And if you study the word of God, you follow how he's living, and then you know that he's telling you the truth. A person who speaks on his own is trying to win praise for himself, but a person who tries to win praise for the one who sent him is honest. There is nothing false about him. Today's preachers, what are we trying to do? <coughs> trying to get praise from you so we can build a kingdom, so we can have whatever we need to have, so we don't want to ruffle your feathers. So as society changes, the church will change because if, as society gets, becomes more acceptable, we must also become more acceptable. But actually what God is saying is we are not honest. We're not honest. Didn't Moshe give you the Torah? That's the question. Yet not one of you obeys the Torah. Why are you out to kill me? And by the way, why are you out to kill me? Because what you're saying is you want to follow Torah. So what he was basically was saying is, why are you out to kill me? Because if you study the Torah, you would know what I'm telling you is the truth. <clears throat> and you would know who I am, and you would follow me. So those who want to kill you really basically haven't studied enough to know what you're saying is true, nor do they want to know that it's true. So they want to live the lie. There's a, um, 
might be in a different interpretation. It talks about being learned or uneducated. And when it talks about <coughs> those who are learned, it refers to the book or, or scroll of Torah. If you have are learned, which means you have studied the book, you understand the Torah. If he's referring to you being uneducated, it means <coughs> you've had no teaching. So what Yeshua was saying was that they were guilty of reading meaning into the written commandments, that they had no real learning of the Torah, and all they had was an empty education in the traditions of the elders. Because they never really studied it. And let's just face it, uh, church people, in the level of our study, <clears throat> we, though we study, we have probably followed more the teachings and the traditions of the elders than we have really studied it our own self. Right? You know, I give to you every Saturday the Torah portion. Some of you will read the Torah portion, but I would venture to say, and this is not to dog anyone, but I would venture to say that we don't study that Torah portion all week long because, you know, <clears throat> it's not a surprise what's coming. You know, it's like the same every year. So we will come and we will sit and we will listen me, you will listen to me expound on the Torah, which is good because there's a certain segment or, or, or position that God wants me to bring out. And so you might, even if you did study, you might not get the same thing that I'm studying. <clears throat> but my point is, it should ring true to you, not because it's coming from my mouth. It should ring true to you because you've already heard it through the Spirit of God somehow in the study that you have gotten it from I'm not here to lead you astray but I'm also not afraid of you studying because I'm not trying to be fake and dishonest I want to be honest with you and we all don't know everything correct but when we are just <coughs> repeating something and just guilty of just reading meaning to the written commandments because we have not ourselves truly studied it If you, and, and this is just a very obvious thing, so if you, and again, I'm not, <clears throat> you know, elevating, but if you said to someone, Saturday is the Sabbath, and they return to you, no, it's Sunday, it's been changed, that's all the far they can go. Now, let me ask you this, is that all the farther you can go? Or are you, be, are you able then to show them systematically through the word of God why that is not so? Again, not for the fight, not for any other, other thing. Just, let's just say it's a natural <clears throat> conversation that came up because you're not, you don't have the T-shirt on that says, ask me about the Sabbath because you're wrong. I'm not, about, you know, I'm not talking about the conflict just to have conflict. I'm talking it naturally came up. Like, you know, a lot of times in our, <clears throat> in our driving school, it naturally comes up. You know, uh, uh, one of the uh, parents on the way out said, and by the way, what is that hanging from your uh, you know, pants? And I said, leave me alone. So I'm tired of you people picking on my strings. No. And I shared with him what it meant. And then I gave him the scripture. And I said, if you want to talk about it later on, you can. But just go home and read it. Because they were spiritual people. You know what I'm saying? And, and so opportunity will be given. But if, if I would just say, well, I saw people do it. I know that's what they do. And, I, and someone said to do it. And so we do it. It doesn't mean anything. You, you understand what I'm saying? So look at look, John 18. 33 through 38. So Pilate went back into the headquarters and called Yeshua and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? And Yeshua answered, Are you asking this on your own or have other people told you about me? <laughs> you, you all don't get sometimes. Uh, Yeshua is just right in there. Do you know what I'm saying? Pilate replied, Am I a Jew? <clears throat> your own nation and head, Koedim, have handed you over to me. What have you done? And Yeshua answered, My kingship does not derive its authority from this world's order of things. You need to underline that because if, you're, if you are his son and you have been reproduced by him, then your authority is not from this world's order either. If it did, my men would have fought to keep me from being arrested by the Judeans, but my kinship does not come from here. So then Pilate said to him, you are a king after all? And Yeshua answered, you say I'm a king. Typical Jew. <clears throat> you ask me a question, I'll answer with a question. 
Are you a king? You say I'm a king. Are you the king of the Jews? You say I'm the king of the Jews. The reason I have been born, the reason I have come into the world is to bear, come on, witness to the truth. Why was he born and why did he come to the earth? Yes, hallelujah, he died for you and hallelujah, he made a way for you. But his birth and his life was to bear witness to this word. I have not come to abolish the word, but I have come to <coughs> show you how to complete it and walk it out. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to me. Wow. There's so much in there can just explode. Pilate asked him, what is truth? And having said this, Pilate went outside again to the Judeans and told them, I don't find any case against him. How do you like that? What is truth? Now, don't tell me. I'll be right back. Has anyone ever asked you what is truth? And when you start telling what is truth, they don't really want to hear what truth is. But that is a question we need to ask ourselves. <clears throat> what is truth? So let's look at it. Psalms 119, 142. How many believe the Psalms are very powerful? How many believe that Psalms are truthful? How many believe that Psalms are part of the Word of God to give us understanding and wisdom? So let's understand it. In Psalms 119, 142, your righteousness is eternal righteousness. And say it with me. And your Torah is truth. I have come to be witness of uh, <coughs> truth. So if that's what he came to be witness of, what is truth? Torah. Just make the connection, that's all. Psalms 119, 151. You are close. You are close by, Adonai, and all your mitzvah are truth. I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. Because if you come to him, because he's the way, he will lead you to that truth, and that truth will bring you to life. <coughs> life here and life eternally. Psalms 119, 160. The main thing about your word is that it's true. And all your just rulings last just until Yeshua comes and dies and is buried and resurrected. Then it's off the table. No, it lasts forever. If his word says that they last forever, then does that mean they'll probably last forever? Yes. John 17, 17. <coughs> set them apart for holiness. How are they going to be set by, apart by holiness? By means of the truth. And then he tells you, your word is truth. How will you be holy? This will set you apart. And you know it'll set you apart because... 80% of the world's not doing it. <clears throat> and when you do it, it really sets you apart. Right? It's like the target on your back or your forehead. Somewhere, someone has placed a target on me. Yeshua taught that obedience to the law is not an option. Luke chapter 11, 27 through 28. I'm going to get ready closer because I'm going to divide this. Because if I go any longer, it'll be past the time. And I don't want you all to <coughs> collapse on me. Yeshua taught that obedience to the law is not an option. So let's look at Luke chapter 11, verses 27 through 28. As Yeshua was saying these things, a woman in the crowd raised her voice to call out, How blessed is the mother that gave birth to you and nursed you from her breast. But he said, Far more blessed are those who hear the word of God and obey it. He stopped them right in the tracks. How blessed is the mother that gave birth to you? No. Though I honor her and appreciate her, <coughs> far more blessed are those who hear the word of God and obey it. That's very enlightening. Because you could say, how blessed you are to come to a church like this. How blessed you are to be come to a place where we worship like this. How blessed you are to come to, no, no. Far more blessed you are if you hear it and obey it. 
as much as the blessing is that you have a house, as much as the blessing you have a nice <coughs> seats to sit in and heat and air sometimes, that works. So in Baruch Hashem that it's working, right? How blessed it is that you didn't grab and w get a horse and come here galloping, that you were able to get in your car. How blessed that is that you live in the society in the day and age, that you don't have to go read your Bible tonight. You can look up, and it's there in front of you. Come on. How blessed it is you can go on the Internet and just type a few words, and things will pop up like you never saw before. You don't have to go to the library anymore, or depending where you come from, library. You can go to the internet. How blessed. But far more blessed are those who hear the word of God. There's a second part. And obey it. Because you can hear it. <clears throat> and if you don't obey it, you're like the prodigal who took the inheritance out and squandered it. And you will end up having to come back. I appreciate the tutor, I appreciate the schoolmaster, I appreciate the guardian, but I also appreciate what he said. You gotta grow up so that you will move from a child to full manhood, to a son. Not that you get to do away with your mother and father, right? Once you learn how to make your bed, you don't get rid of your mother and father. You will need them all the days of your life, and all of us <coughs> who have lost a mother or father or both know that you you needed them more than you thought, right? More than you appreciated them while they were here. So all my children, listen, appreciate us while we're here. When I need water, get it for me. We want to always have me to have blood. But far more blessed are those. Would rather have a church, instead of filled with people who are just hearers, a church with people who hear and Obey, because that means you're going to be really far more blessed. <clears throat> so let me let me wrap it up here and stop here with Exodus chapter 24, verse 7 and 8. So mark it where you know that we've stopped. Then he took the book of the covenant and read it aloud. So what did he read aloud? Which is Torah. We just need to make those connections so you understand. And he did what with it? He read it aloud so that the people could what? Hear. What's the next three words? And they responded. <clears throat> what did you? Blessed are those. Far more blessed are those who hear and obey. Are those who hear and respond. Because what good is it for you to hear tonight and not respond to it? Right? What a blessing it is that you could hear it. Because there's people in the world that can't hear it. But far more blessed are you that if you obey it. Everything that Adonai has spoken, here's how they responded. Say it with me. We will do and obey. It's hard to respond sometimes. <laughs> we will do <coughs> and obey. And then Moshe took the blood, sprinkled it on the people, and said, this is the blood of the covenant which Adonai has made with you in accordance with all these words. We have some sort of a flip. Because what we do is we come to Adonai and we accept him into our hearts and he applies the blood to our lives, correct? And then we say to him, <coughs> we will do and obey. They came to him because they knew him, right? They followed him. They had already placed the blood of the lamb on the doorpost, so they were saved. <coughs> now when they come, and before they even understand all of the covenant, because they've heard it, they respond. I don't see any. Do we have any questions? Do we do you need any clarification? He read it and they immediately responded. Now, we know that they need a clarification because <clears throat> he was set up as the judge and they would go and, and ask. But they didn't need to know all the ins and outs before they agreed. Because they knew who he was. So you don't need to know all the ins and outs and what because you know who he is and he's a father. And if a natural father knows how to give good gifts to you then how much more does your Heavenly Father know what to give to you? And this is the most powerful gift He's ever given to you because this gift will bring you blessings and life. <clears throat> so Moshe took the blood sprinkler on the people and said, this is the blood of the covenant which Adonai has made with you in accordance with what words? All these words. The words that were spoken 
from the covenant of the book to the words that you spoke that said, we will hear, we will understand, and we will be obedient. <coughs> we will hear, we will understand, and we will be obedient. You need to put that beside your bed because every morning that's what you need to say to him. I have heard you. I understand you. And today I will be obedient to you. Not a Today. Today. And sometimes when you're in, <coughs> in a moment, when you're having that moment, when you're having a decision whether to follow him or not, you need to have that memorized. So <coughs> when unforgiveness rises up, you say, no, I have heard him. I understand him. And I will be obedient. Wouldn't that help us a lot? If we could memorize that and just have that. Some, some of you would probably will be saying that a lot. But maybe eventually you would only say it in the morning, maybe once in the afternoon, maybe in the beginning you would say it like every five minutes. Like when you're waiting in line for Walmart. Not a saving, not a smile. People are, what's wrong with you? No. Not a saving, not a smile. Then they start moving away from you, and you're like, hallelujah, it's working. <laughs> They're getting out of the line. Hallelujah, I'm going to the <laughs> I'm Thank you. Should be a, uh, we should make, uh, <coughs> you know, shirts and things. Because it's so important. Because after they said that, what did Moses do? Take the blood and what? What does that mean? It is sealed. It is sealed. It is sealed. <coughs> and this will last what? Forever. Okay. Any questions? The jots and the tittle are, are you, you know, when they write Hebrew, I don't know if you can find. <coughs> can you find something? Okay. He's going to find. We're going to show you a jot and a tittle, a tittle and a jot, I think. Maybe underneath my foot we'll find one. No, it's not my foot. <laughs> no, it's not my foot. But um, when they're writing Hebrew, <coughs> sometimes they become very fancy with crowns and 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 uh, accents and different things, and so they would be the jot and the tittle. So even those things matter, even beyond the words. Those, <coughs> see that. I'm coming. So like the small letter, you know, here is a jot. Here's the tittle. <coughs> this is the crown lit. So all of this matters. And remember, I said I think uh, maybe it was last week that. The, the rabbis say that when he created the earth he, and when, you sh when the Messiah will come, he will show us even what lies in the spaces. So that's the tittle <coughs> and the jot and the crownlets and that he, he even interprets those. That's what that means. In some shape or form, that's what that means. We do know that some are, again, <coughs> suspended for the simple reason there's no temple. So those that are, have no temple, when the temple is reinstituted, they will also flow. We also know that some laws have to do with if you live in Israel, and we don't live in Israel, so you have to live by the law of the, of the land. So th those are only things that are shifted and different. But we know when Yeshua comes, and he is, he is the government through all the land, then those things would be reinstituted because it's, it's, it's taken on a different <coughs> uh, change slightly. You know what I'm saying? Well, in some of those things, yes. But if you've been engrafted in, then you're part of Israel. But because of the location that you're in, <coughs> those things might be a little bit different. But all of it will come back around because he's cyclical. Do you know what I'm saying? And so though it's not able, you know, we don't have a, uh, we know we have a high priest, which is him, but we don't have a Levitical 
order. We don't have uh, the altar to bring sacrifice to. So that's why it's we still bring sacrifices and they still bring sacrifices by our prayers and our thanksgiving. <coughs> so it's it's taken on a new understanding until the temple comes and re is returned. So they they still bring sacrifices, which is what we in Ephesians says, uh, <coughs> bring a sacrifice of praise, bring a sacrifice of worship and and prayer. So there's still sacrifices being offered just in a different way until a temple would be reinstituted. But it doesn't mean it's all it doesn't mean it's abolished. It just means it's waiting to be operational. Some of those things, for instance, you have rules in your house about a child. If that child leaves, the rule is still set. It's just not an operation because there's no child there. You didn't change the rule. <clears throat> because if the grandchildren now come back in, the rule is the same. Do you know what I'm saying? Don't touch the knickknacks. I'm just remembering my childhood from my grandmother. Don't touch the knickknacks. So when you got old enough, you never touched the knickknacks. And maybe then you left and you went to North Carolina and you haven't seen your grandma. And then you come back with children. When you walk in the house, what do you say to your, your own children? Don't touch the knickknacks. <clears throat> Though it was seemingly to be suspended because there was no one there to touch the knickknacks. It was still there until someone comes in to touch the knickknacks, and then that law is still in force. Does that make any clarity? So there's a sacrifice to be given on the altar. There is no altar, so we give it in a different way. But if the altar is erected, we would bring a sacrifice because that has not changed. It's just not there to give. Where is it Israel born? I know you keep saying that. Where is that? Can, where is that? Can you all know? Can you? Yeah, he's he's looking for it. He's looking for it. Yeah, which is why we try to do it to the best of our ability. <coughs> Spend some time in a booth. Not, I mean, not, not sure, not all, but we try to go out in that little tent. We try to do that, you know. Yeah, that's that's <coughs> that's doing your your best to keep. I was like, someone's behind me. It's Pastor Ben. That's <laughs> that's doing your best to keep those commandments. Yes, as, as simple as that is. You know, which is why we eat it. That's why we erect the tabernacle. We eat underneath the booth. Trying to <coughs> assimilate, not trying to assimilate, but trying to to um, use a symbolism so that we can remember what it is to be in the tabernacle. And even, even if we never spent time in the tabernacle in the desert, we're still remembering how the ancestors did and the patriarchs and matriarchs did. So, yes, it's all part of rehearsing and rethinking and and part of the training. It's part of the training of that child. I think he's still looking. Well, he's no, he's doing it for clean, uh, for <coughs> clean, and and making sure that no disease. So we have the same thing, and that we would clean it with materials that would make it be clean again. You couldn't do that back in those days, so you would destroy the oven. Now, if you found that mouse in that oven, you just said, hmm, and then cook something else in it. Then you would be breaking the commandment because it's all about cleaning. So you should have cleaned the oven. <coughs> taking care of the disease or whatever had laid on that. Because, you know, a lot of those laws are for about um, keeping them free from disease. Right. Right. So really it's 
uh, you're, you're still doing the commandment, <clears throat> but it's altered slightly because it's not a clay oven. And again, you just want to clean it. If you do, that's great. You are to live in uh, Sukkot for seven days. Every, citi every citizen of Israel is to live in a Sukkot. So that generation after generation of you will know that I make, made the people of Israel live in Sukkot when I brought them out of the land of Egypt. I am Adonai, your God. So, huh? Uh, live in temporary shelters for seven days. All native-born Israelites are to live in uh, such shelters so your descendants will know. <coughs> Let's say blessing or anything in the seventh day. Live in temporary shelters for seven days. All native-born Israelites are to live in. Sh uh, is that the same? It's just a different interpretation? Oh, okay. I was like, am I reading something different? Which one is this one? And which one is this one? Okay. So all native-born Israelites Every citizen of Israel is to live in a Sukkot. You do see the difference. Do you? One would say all native born, which gives, which gives the idea that these commandments are only for Jewish people. <clears throat> this interpretation, which is from the complete Jewish Bible, which would be more along the line of what it said in Hebrew, um, every citizen of Israel to live in a sukkah. And we know that you don't have to be native born to be a citizen. And that if you're born again, <coughs> you've been engrafted into the citizenship of Israel. So really what Yeshua was saying, because we see him saying it over and over again, the, <coughs> the, the Israel, the foreigner, the one living among you, he, you know, all must engage. So if you have attached yourself to Israel, then that is your commandment. <coughs> when it says, uh, live in temporary shelters, all native born, again, that's a different translation, so you would need to go deeper in translation and say, does he say all just natural native born or those who have <coughs> come into Israel and attached themselves to, to Israel? And we know that we are engrafted in, so we are part of the national citizenship of Israel. So yes, you are Israel. Right. Right. I mean, to fulfill this completely, you would need to get a temporary booth and uh, make T and Antonio live out there for you. Uh, they, was, they will live out there and proxy for you. <laughs> you will bless them in your name. So then when they live out there, they're living, you're living out. No, I'm just kidding. Yes. <coughs> it is something that we, it's commandment to do. So we're, we're following that. Yes. Tonight would have been a great night. It seems sometimes sukkah, uh, when it comes, it's always on a cold night, freezing night or something. Yes. All right. Any other questions? All right. Hallelujah. Let's stand before Adonai. Mark it where I stop because I won't remember because I'll be preaching a line of Judah too and I get confused. 